Fucking put your vape away and fucking bang your head with gay abandon, you fucking <laughs> Coming up on The Realm, we catch up with metal riff lord Tommy Victor from Prong. He talks all things Prong, Danzig, and plenty of other stuff in between. And topping things off with some killer live music. Enjoy.
Welcome to the program. You're with host Andrew Hogan, of course, Stephen Mitchell. Just thought I'd say g'day and how you doing, Stephen? What's been happening? Well, it's kind of it still feels like it's. Uh, the, the, I don't know if you played video games back in the '90s, but there was a ba- ga- game called nope. Doom, and there was I think a, a level in that game called Knee Deep in the Dead, and it's kind of like that's the way it's kind of feeling. But uh, I'm feeling pretty chirpy today. So really, okay, yeah, well, you're not the workouts. Definitely not a gamer at all, and no time for games, just time for riffs. And speaking of riffs. Our first guest for the show tonight uh, is just, to me, an absolute riff meister. He's, he's a legend. I love him. I love his music. Still, I mean, if anything, the last four records from this great band, Prong, have been incredible. And let's welcome Tommy Victor to the program. Welcome, Tommy, the man. Hey, good to see you, Andrew, Stephen. Man, thank you for having me on this. It's awesome. My pleasure. Like I said, you know, Prong have been, to me, one of the most consistent metal bands in the genre, you know, I don't recall a bad record. And if anything, the last three albums, including the latest EP, Age of Defiance from 2019, just the consistency is enormous. So I guess the biggest question is where, how you're finding, you know, keeping the motivation and the talent of, of bringing such great songs forward, especially in this time and with such a long career as Prong. I mean, a lot of it's luck. I mean, you just throw things against the wall and see what happens. And the, the budgets for these records are so nothing. And uh, just got lucky on some of the songs. And I had some help with a couple of dudes, helped out on it. So, uh, yeah, that that always is a good plus. Uh, mainly Chris Collier, this guy who I met. And uh, he's been getting a lot of gigs. He's an L.A. kid. And... Uh, He's just amazing. I and mean, we just crank out, we cranked out a couple of records and did it really well. And you know, I had Steve Evitz, who's another good producer. So I need another guy to work with and a guy that kicks my ass. And that's really how we got it done, you know. And uh, what I try to do is just make sure we get it out on time and like don't spend a lot of money on these things these days. But uh, now I don't really have that much inspiration because of what all this bullshit that's going on. And, uh, you know, like now I'm like, I don't even know what to say. Like, like you guys are like, oh, it's going to be fun. It's fun. My interview, I feel like I'm smiling. And I'm saying like, I'm so, I don't even have any thoughts anymore. It's like, I'm just so bored. And then like, I'm just a boring person. I'm not bored, but it's just like, what can you possibly say anymore about anything? You know, it's just, it's dumbfounding just how everything wound up. You know what I mean? So, so I guess uh, the lyrics. That's all I have to say. Goodbye. Good night. Okay. No, just well, kidding. <laughs> well, I guess the uh, yeah the lyrics of the song without words have certainly come true. But as you mentioned yeah. about luck, I mean, I guess to a degree, people say you make your own luck, but I don't see it as luck. I just see you as a talented songwriter. I mean, I don't think that this stuff falls out of the sky. I mean, I believe what you create is what you put out. So. Uh, I guess that's your humble way of, of, of looking at it. But uh, like I said, the consistency of Prong's music at the last four albums have just been incredible. So it's got to be coming from somewhere, not just luck. You know, you've got to be drawing something from somewhere. Uh, damn. I mean, I think it was from being so busy, like playing guitar, really. I mean, where it comes to look, one of the reasons to get serious on it, uh, you know, like coming out of ministry, doing my time with Al, then like Glenn was was real busy for a while, so I was going, you know, flying into a, a Danzig tour for a week, and then coming back doing prong for two weeks, and then, you know, going back and you know, coming back home and had a couple of weeks, and you know, uh, what I started doing was just writing like a riff, coming up with riffs and sound checks, and uh, then you have like, you know, three hundred riffs, and then when I got back home. You know, I dumped them from my phone onto the computer, and I was just like, okay, this one I'm going to, like, I don't even know what key that is. I don't even know what I'm doing. So I relearned them and then, you know, put put it to a click track, and then you start, like, going, what am I going to put to that? And then, you know, I mean, it's just from from that kind of, that's how really they come about. And then the lyrics is a whole other ball game because I have to sing this crap and write lyrics. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a whole other ball game. That's where staying up till five in the morning trying to figure out one line on some of this shit. It's just, uh, it's just crazy, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it, it was the fact that prong went away for a while and, um, you know, some of our fans, like we lost a lot because of that. And I was like, you know, like if I'm going to end up my career and have this legacy, I gotta like 
churn out a couple of really decent records and spend some some time on them, you know. So it had a lot to do with that. It was like pride. It's all about pride. It's all about ego. That's all it is. So. Yeah. Well, like I said, churning out the releases, I was just amazed. Like No Absolutes was 2016, and then Zero Day is 2017, and Age of Defiance 2019. And I was just like, Jesus, because some bands over a lengthy career tend to take a lot longer to put out records. They might not be as inspired or they're kind of heralded from their smarter. past. But... They're smarter. I'm an idiot for doing it. Like, <laughs> because it is. It's true. It's like you're someone's like, why, why are you putting out so many records? Nobody gives a fuck. And that is a factor these days. I mean, like I got a Testament shirt on. Like they came out, you know, They had a long duration of between records and then they come out with another one. And it's just like, I'm just, you know, like, you know bands are like especially legacy bands is like why are we putting records out you know it's like because uh you know essentially would be like you're you're really up on the new records and stuff but even the basically you know um even to this day you know it's like people know one song from prong and it's snap your finger snap your neck i mean the essential the regular public you know so um Fuck it's, them. it's like that for a lot of bands, you know. We got, yeah. we got your hit song, and it was like, oh, you know, what are you doing? You, they don't even know where you put new records out. So, uh, but I appreciate your comments, and uh, you know, I pretty much did it for the legacy of the band. And uh, you know, there's also there was a live record. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, there's a live record that we put out, and then there was um, uh, a covers record, songs from the Black Hole, and that covers record. I probably have to spend more time on that record then try you know trying to figure out how to make interpretations of those songs then on the regular records it was like and you don't get any publishing money so that was a big waste of time not really i mean some people like it but that can get noticed too especially like you know we did this version of cortez the killer by neil young and it's like to interpret a neil young song and then like redo the guitar somehow was just one of the biggest challenges of my career honestly it's like how do i what do i do with this thing and then i'm really happy the way it came out because finally i was like you know it's like it almost sounds like if trouble did a version of neil young you know and that was like i thought that was cool finally coming up with that so you know i mean it's it's, it's some of these things have been fun like now i like again i don't even know what to say if somebody said you know write a bunch of lyrics tommy i wouldn't even know what to do because like two years ago i was like Oh fuck! I'll write a record in three weeks. I'll do it. I could. Somebody said you got to do a record for, for because of the shenanigans out there. I'm like, I don't even know what to do now. But we'll see. You know, we'll see what what happens in the future. But it just happens. It's how things are and how you're feeling at this time too. I mean, uh, I have a whole different set of you know mindset right now. So yeah. Now, speaking of covers albums, Stephen has a question for you regarding the Glenn, uh, the, the uh, Glenn Danzig Elvis record, which I do believe you played on, Stephen. What is your question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you play guitars oh, no, on no, that no, or no, did you no, play no, keys? I don't know or? Really Sorry? <laughs> uh, no, actually, uh, before, before we jump into that, uh, you know, you talk about you can whip out an album in three weeks, yeah, if I need to do it. How much do you think songwriting and particularly riff writing is? It's almost like going to the gym, and is it you got to work out? And if you're not doing the reps and the sets, you you lose the gains. And and do you feel it's the same way with with riff writing and songwriting? As if you're not actively keeping that up, you just lose the ability to do that. That's a a really good question, and there's two ways of looking at it. It depends who you're trying to compete with, like. Um, Let's face it, like these kids today are unbelievable. Like, you know, they have the, the, the tools that they've had in developing their playing abilities is beyond your comprehension. Because like, I mean, I'm an old fuck and we had to like, I learned off of regular vinyl records years ago. I mean, I had to go back and forth on the stylus and scratch up the records and then you lend them to somebody and you get like Zeppelin three back and it'd be all fucked up and you'd only learn half of immigrant song or something, you know, it's like, so it's like, you, the, who are you competing with? And, uh, you know, sometimes like, again, I refer to Neil Young, he doesn't compete with anybody and he doesn't have to. And like guitar players like that, I sort of, um, I, I sort of like to fit in more with that. So Jeff Beck was like that too. He goes, I don't fucking practice. You know, he's like, I don't practice. What's practice. Well, you know, he would go out and race cars for a year and then come back and make a record. So, you know, if you're into that 
riff competition, if you want, if you're trying to compete with, with these kids today, who are just like unbelievable technically, uh, then forget it. I mean, you got to be like practicing 30 hours a second or something, you know, like, I mean, that doesn't make any sense, but it, it's just, how do you do that? If you're just trying to be a stylist, maybe it's a good idea just to like not play for a while and just like roll in and just like do it, you know? So well, uh, I'm old school. Like I would prefer it that way. I, I mean, to me, like the music is sort of, um, it's just, it, it's just from the heart and like, you know, you go in and like the, like I've, I've come most, most of the best riffs I've done the stuff like I pick up the guitar, like if I picked up something right now and I came up with something, I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool, you know. Like, you know, that's, if, you know, the ones that, the ones that I think that are clever and that are competing with other guitar players, and you know, I'm like, oh wow, that's like the other guitar players are gonna like, and you know, I'm gonna try to compete with young players. They never really, it, it always never really makes it on the record or. You know, people are just like, well, what the fuck is that? You know, I got to be, you know, I got to be me. I got to be Tommy Victor, which is, you know, simplicity too, you know, like, you know, the more you practice and the more you're like trying to match what other people are doing, the more complicated it's going to get. And like, then you're going to be insecure and, you know, so sometimes it's just better to just do whatever the hell you want to do, you know? So, for example, when you're on tour and you, you mentioned, you know, you might come up with things at soundcheck and you get back home after a few weeks and you've got hundreds of riffs. When, when you maybe sitting on stage during soundcheck and you're just noodling around, is that what, what, what's the spark that gets you going? Like, you, you know, cool. You, like, like, a lot of times playing in a big room, like with Danzig, like we play big rooms. So, like, you know, you get on a guitar and you're playing fucking loud and like you you put your amp on and it's just you hear it in this big stage and it's like and that that's a lot different than when you're in headphones in your home like in a computer and pro tools and you know you're you're trying to you know do this you know the, the vibe isn't there you know so it's like that's like that's like the, the great old guys like blackmore and shit there's like with this this you go into a studio with just this volume and you it's just this big ego trip is like it's part of the game you know so maybe that has something to do with it now you mentioned before as again about you being you i think that is why you have your own sound and you talk about competing with bands today there's way too many emulators even though there's amazing players amazing techniques technologies we're in a pretty crazy time for music creators the only thing is i'm struggling with at times and not to be with jaded ears but hearing originality is very very rare because there's so many hybrids and a lot of emulations and it's so difficult to actually hear something where you just go, what is this without it being a completely ridiculous mashup of something that doesn't make sense, but it's unique, but I'm more referring to sort of songwriting and, and memorable sort of heavy metal songs oh, yeah. without sort of following a template. And that's why, like I said, I've always had massive respect for you and prong as a, as a songwriter, because no one sounds like prong and that's how it should be in order to, 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 to make a mark and leave a mark that you've got your own thing. And that's what a lot of people try to get to, but they focus more on the technique and the chops versus being themselves. So they end up sounding like somebody else. I know that Phil Anselmo once said um, about advice to young bands, which made a lot of sense. He said, you know, rip off 20 bands, not two, because eventually you'll have your own vibe. I mean, early Pantera, okay, they had the glam shit, but then Cowboys Onwards was a kind of a mishmash of, you know, sort of Metallica and, and Judas Priest, but you heard Pantera and you knew it was them and they had their own vibe, even though they knew their influences, it wasn't a complete emulation. So that's my well, that's rant. A great com that's a great comment and a great statement from him because i mean i totally agree with that i mean that's what we did i mean we you know we, we were fortunate to have like this diverse influence the the diverse influences when we started out and um like you know i was i i grew up sort of a what metal was like back which was sabbath and purple and you know believe it or not like cream and you know, it was like, and then Kiss, and then, like, later on, got into, like, you know, anything from, 
you know, Sisters of Mercy and then the post-punk shit, Killing Joke, obviously, is a huge influence. So all of that stuff and even progressive rock, like, you know, like Yes and Tall and, you know, um, you know, and then, uh, then Thrash Metal and came around. So we we almost made that decision. We're like, we're going to to be different. We're going to pick from this. Kind of, where's the Killing Joke influence in this? And where's this to make sure that there is something you know, different. I sort of lost a, a lost a little bit of that along the way because, like you said, like I started saying, you know, it's, is it a good song? Like I didn't. After a while, I was like, is this? I think we went too further, like that, trying to be different, and it, it's sort of like that's why, like the band had a demise from that because the general audiences are they're clueless in that that edge. They just want to hear a good song. So eventually, I, I after years and years, I got like, all right. That's what I was talking about earlier, like trying to be too clever and shit that regular people, they don't give a fuck about that. So it's like, uh, you know, whether is this, is this cool or is it people maybe, you know, you like it. And, you know, again, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, what the general audience is like, but you know, I do like a hook and I like, a, I like a rock and roll song too. So it's like, that really makes a big difference to me. So you have like to you know, draw from different bands and then make sure you're doing rock and roll songs and, you know, but that's not even popular today. Like I, we were on the road, like, uh, and we had I had um, these young kids uh, as a crew, like these guys that were cheap and these kids, and they were actually good kids, and uh, they were turning me on to a lot of new bands, and they were sort of like, well, you know, you know, we don't we don't think like you you older guys do. Like we don't give a fuck about like the song structure and having those hooks and everything. And I'm like, okay, so you know they do everything. The contrary, like, like it's all the vocals, just extreme of consciousness. Like we don't repeat the vocals and lyrics and stuff. So, I mean, I get it, you know, I got that too. Uh, but um, I don't think I could, I, I mean, I don't know if I would continually listen to that, you know, it's like, you know, um, it's like, well, why, you know, really? So, well, you know, I think some of this songwriting comes from an urgency of the, the generation that they're in now because there is so much stuff coming at you know, a lot of these younger players and as you mentioned, not repeating a line and adding, you know, so many riffs into the song. I guess, as you said, they're not focusing on remembering it. It's just getting it out because they're probably just, there's so much information coming into their minds. They're just trying to translate it out into music, <laughs> which is why it's a mishmash because you hear, you know, how many riffs in that song is about 48. What the hell? There's way too many, but that's kind of where it's at for some of these bands. But again, there's also a lot of great younger bands that are, uh, uh, giving a nod to the old school as well by by focusing on on uh, that. I mean, there's plenty of young bands doing the power metal thing that sound like early Iron Maiden and, oh and my God. Judas yeah. Priest and Halloween. No, but uh, again, as we know, there's so many subgenres now in metal. It's quite quite ridiculous. But it's an, I know that it's mm. one of the reasons why. Like you know, I sometimes I'm like you know like why try to go there? You know, it's it's uh, it's like it's hard to compete. Like especially the power metal scene. I mean, oh my God! I mean, now that got crazy with, you know, with the bands that that just came around, you know, and all the Wolf bands, and you know, a lot of them are they're great. I mean, I really, you know, I mean, I listen to them and I'm like blown away. I mean, I, but still, um, you know, it's 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 like I prefer to listen to Saxon. You know, like that's I still go back to those, you know, like Origins. or even like a recent Saxon live record or. You know, and then priests, like, you know, I, I just, I'm an old dude. I, you know, those stuff, it just, I, it overstimulates me, some of this shit. It's like a confused, you know, so it's like, but um, no, this power metal scene is, is it, those bands are really cool. And I like something like a band like Bullet, like a band that's sort of like power metal, but like have like just excellent guitar playing and like in, in the essence of blues rock guitar players, which I still prefer to, you know, um, the arpeggiotic. Thing. I, I I start hearing that now I can't I can't do it man sorry can't it's like and gents I can't do it anymore <laughs> either can't go anywhere near it all taken from the school of Meshuggah riffs even with drumming today I'm a drummer as you know and it's just like the playing wow. is just next level where. It, it gets beyond the point of songwriting. It's just how fast are you? It's like sports. Music's become almost, totally. or if anything, like a sports competition of, you know, fastest drummer, fastest riff. I mean, it, it's fun. It's great if it's a good challenge for you. But end of the day, you know, you want to nod your head to something that um, you can enjoy, but eats their own, I guess, well, now. 
it's not like that pretty much. I think you know, where it is like a sport because, um, you know, it is, it's just, it is all like that because, um, you know, metal and rock music gets so little attention anymore. So it's like, you know, the kids see it as a challenge, as a, as just like a workout or something they can excel at without any ideas of like, um, selling records or doing anything else. I mean, where they just want YouTube plays or whatever the hell it is. It's a different scene. You know, it's like, it's not, you know, it's so hard to, you know, uh, come out of a rock scene these days and make, you know, any, uh, any career out of it. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, it's hard. It's, it's so difficult, it's way more hard than, you know, when prom started at least, you know? Do you also think that it's lost its rebellious edge because, you know, anybody plays metal now? <laughs> like, literally, you don't have to have a fucked up childhood or some, you know, deep-rooted issues to express yourself because that's kind of what it was when it started. It was outside of music. It was for those who are in dysfunctional families or lives or didn't feel like they fit in. Now, anybody's sort of out there playing metal, and okay, they can. There's no rules or anything like that, but as far as that kind of us against them kind of vibe. Uh, do you feel that that has sort of been diminished over the years, especially now with so oh, many my God. subgenres and I mean, segregations? Oh, no, really. I mean, everything you're saying is like, I, I forgot that really, because you know, I try to put it out of my mind. I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, this is going back, man, like 15 years ago, there's a band that became really successful and they're not bad guys that, I'm not going to name who they are, but they opened up for Danzig and on a tour and um, they were just like, I mean, it, you know, it's, they were one of that, that generation that started where their parents uh, weaned them to be like rock stars or something like, which like, you know, they, at six years old, they got them all the gear and, you know, their parents were at the shows and they got them all the lessons and, you know, they paid for them for all this stuff. And it's like, you know, um, uh, just total support from, you know, their family. And like, there was not any, it was, there was not any rebellion or anything, anything like that in there. And they got fucking just their lyrics and their songs were like, Oh, and they were, they sounded hard and everything, but forget it. I mean, they lived in like, I wouldn't even, even not even to tell, to give a clue who they are. They lived in a very posh area of America and just like, and I was like, it pissed me off. I mean, it really did. It was like, you know, fuck these kids, you know, but they were, they, it was not their fault. I mean, they were good kids and, and they're an excellent band. I mean, like they're, you can't really, I mean, I don't listen to them, but I mean, as far as execution, when I saw them and they came out, because Danzig is pretty much just like the punk band, like, you know, we're not really that good. I mean, it's like, you know, uh, it's not polished at all. I mean, it's like, it's just a sloppy mess, the band. So, um, but it's got a vibe when they came out there, you know, I was like, holy shit, this band's going to be fucking huge. And yeah, they, they sort of fell out a little bit, then came back up again, you know, but, uh, you know, it's like that, that would, that bothered the hell out of me. And then eventually I, I got over it, you know, it's like, but it seemed like, like, then you saw more and more of that. It's like, you know, uh, you know, the kids that had the silver spoons in their mouths started being successful and, you know, they, they lost all that real hardcore street thing is gone. And I mean, if anything, Prong's got that totally every Lower East Side band, like, I don't know, you know, this agnostic front and Prong, you know, like really nobody else really, Cro-Mags, you know, like, so we were down and dirty and living in the fucking, you know, in the and the shit down there so but no one gives a fuck anymore about that shit you know really only old people do just on that it, because a lot of people tend to forget that new york hardcore was born new york, new york hardcore music was born out of hardcore new york it was a dirty dangerous um city and, and, and oh. you know it's been decades of, of gentrification and people completely forget that and the bands were born out of that environment. Now, given given that you've been out of that environment for you know, uh, I guess several decades now, uh, living on the west coast, do you, where where do you drive the inspiration? How how much are you driven by your exp, uh, experiences in your early years compared to 
you know, living in a different environment. And it's sort of like a, there's like a hard wire thing with me that, I mean, now that I'm, I'm, I'm older, I've gotten through a lot of those things with, you know, uh, um, sometimes I could see myself going back to some of the lyrics. I'm like, whoa. And like, you know, I've, I've hit on the same edge that I had had even as writing lyrics for the early prong stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I think about it back into the lyric side of where I'm coming from. And, but we were definitely, uh, when you're younger too, I mean, you're hung, we were so hungry. Like we were, uh, and it was, there was and a real scene and we were hungry and we, but we didn't fit into the scene and we hated everybody. And we, it was just every day was a fight, you know, and I think that was cool. Like we fought with every other band and we, you know, we were competing with every other band and, um, you know, it was sort of like helmet versus prong versus white zombie versus war zone versus chromax and typo negative. And it was just like this, you know, no one really liked one another, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, and you were allowed to not like anybody back then. Now you have to like everybody. And otherwise you're just, you're not politically correct. And no one cared about that back then. We didn't want to fit into this niceties that everyone, Oh my bud, everyone's now it's like buddy, buddy. And yeah. Oh man. You know, like that's just the way you have to be now is everything so political because of, you know, social media and we're afraid to upset this one and everyone's my friend on social media and all this bullshit. So that didn't exist back then. It was like, no, fuck this band. They ripped off one of our riffs and we hate them. You know, I was like, that was the way it was. So and, but, there's a lot of that, you know, you don't get, I don't think anybody has that anymore. Where is there a scene? Maybe in Australia, there's probably some of that because, you know, uh, you're in a whole other isolated existence there, but, uh, Oh, America we have we, we we have our own in bitching here too, man. It's ridiculously bad. <laughs> no, it's good though. That's good. I'm glad you know. Now everyone's got to be friends, you know. Yeah. The only, the only bands that still keep going with those schisms of the hard, like the old hardcore bands, like you know, Harley is still mad at John Joseph, and you know that whole thing, and you know, you know, Glenn is still mad at. At, at Jerry and like yeah, you know, it's only the old guys that have that. All the other the young bands are all buddies. They're all friends, and you know they uh, do their they, they lift weights together and it's bullshit. So you know. Now back to the dancing question. Stephen wants to find out about the Elvis record. Yeah, I understand you were part of that. Um, what was it like uh, uh, being in the studio and and doing something very uh, different to what you normally do? Well, Glenn's like a really good friend of mine. Like, believe it or not, I mean, like, you know, we've known each other for a long time and, you know, we've been on the road for so long together. And uh, I told, I, I have, uh, he never ceases to amaze me. Like, you know, his, his knowledge of old music and like of records and it's so legitimate. Like he knows every freaking Elvis song and every, what records it was on and who wrote them and all this stuff. I mean, you know, you, you it's like, that's almost the, the, that was almost the charm of it. It's just like, Oh, you know, this was like, you know, it was done by Conway Twitty and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like what song are we do? It's like, Oh, you know, and like, you'd have to, he goes, we're going to work on a couple of, you know, after we finish some dancing stuff, uh, we're going to do some Elvis covers. So I'm like, um, fine, you know, like which ones? Oh, well, when we get in there, so he'd be like, he played the song for me once. I'm like, I don't know, the, some of the ones that are on that record, I never heard them before. Like, they're not, you know, it's not, it's not Blue Slade Shoes and, you know, and, uh, and uh, Viva Las Vegas on this record. Let's put it that, that way, you know, they're all, they're not a, extremely obscure Elvis songs, but they're not like, you know, and he's like, oh, you don't know that one? He's going to play with me once. It's like, okay, uh, uh, this is the, this is the chord structure, and it's just like okay, play it, and and that was it. That's all I did. You know, it's like he just wanted it to be fat, like like done really fast, like without that much thought and like without any production really. Go in and sing it, and and you know that was it. Let me go, Joey. Castillo played a couple of drums on some stuff, and we had a bunch of different, you know, like some stuff he added the drums later. I don't even know. Like, well, it's not only sometimes there's not even any drums on it. And it's like I go, I was like, Glenn, you want me to put bass on it? And he's like, No, there's, I'm not putting bass on it. 
You know, it's just like, it's just his mentality of stuff. Is, is, it's so weird. But it's mainly a tribute to those songs. I mean, those songs are killer. I mean, the ones that he picked are, after listening to them and like getting to know them, they're like, they're really great songs. And, you know, that's really the gist of it. It's like, you know, hey, we got there's some really great Elvis songs that no one knows. And, you know, I'm going to sing them. And, you know, this has got always on my mind a bit. We, everyone knows that one. Uh, you know, but it's, it's, it was, it was an interesting experience because, um, you know, he didn't really let me know, you know, like what exactly was going on and he never really does. And it's just like, you know, go in and do it. And, um, that was it. You know, it's like, um, I'm, I'm happy to be involved. You know, it's Glenn Danzig, you know, it's like, he's awesome. You know? So, uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. And a lot of people bitch about the sound quality on the thing. It's like, whatever you know and like I, i've gotten ripped to shreds about my parts on them by numerous people and it's like you know so in the end all be all who cares really i mean we didn't try to do like a polished record you know it was just sort of you know it was the idea the concept of glenn doing singing those songs and really just like i don't think any of them were more than a couple of takes or anything he just went in and did it really you know so uh that's really the it's how we wanted to do it. Now you've known Glenn for for quite a long time and, and worked with Glenn uh, over that period. Uh, he's obviously one of the the great songwriters. I think over the last you know forty fifty years, have you picked up any uh, tips, tricks, techniques off of Glenn from a songwriting perspective? Uh, that you, you it's hard with him. Because he he's just so he's he's on a different talent level. Like yeah, you know, that's what I was saying. Like I sort of have to will songs together and. Um, his musical vocabulary is like, is just like another, another dimension deeper than me. Like where he, like, he, like again, like he, he goes further deep into like, as far as a vocalist too, you know, like, and that's um, where he's so it, it, like Bowie and Mark Bolin and Rod Evans and Elvis and uh, Gene Pitney and you know the, the list goes on of people that are just like so ingrained in him that like you know he's 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 got it soaked in so much you know and Jim Morrison and you know it's like you know they, they they're so soaked into him that I can't you know like he he'll, he's he's so good. That that's why I mean a lot of the, the like the recent records that I'm I'm on, they just really like the musically they they're, they're not like opuses, they're they're pretty basic chord progressions and it's really but he, like he can take something like that and make magic out of it because like he's just has so many melodies and it's like that he could just pop out. He doesn't have to put this amazing amount of thought into shit like, you know, somebody like me is like I gotta will a record together and you know and he doesn't think that much. Like he comes up with one little, the one riff that's just, you know, it's a basic riff, you know, and he'll, and as the dancing records are, I mean, like, you know, they're like, they're not these like mind blowing riffs, like, you know, like a, like a dime bag riff or, you know, what have you, or a Tony Iommi riff, you know, they're rock and roll riffs and he's able to, to just throw out these melodies and come up with lyrics that, very quickly that are just amazing so uh you know that's that's i'm not i can't i i can't even go there because of where where he comes from you know now let's get back into a little bit more prong now obviously art cruz your drummer that was with the band for quite a number of years uh has since joined lamb of god and again he did some great work on uh on on the prong albums as well uh where do you see things heading as far as drummers for prong and also you know will it change the structure and songwriting because he did some amazing work well we had we had uh Aaron rossi has been back in the last year and a half doing shows so uh you know uh is he a permanent member a, i don't know what i'm doing with that yet i mean he's like he was uh, we got to figure that out because if I got to move, I need a guy out back in New York. So uh, I got to see. But I mean, Aaron's been fantastic. I mean, a lot of people have liked Aaron better than, than Art. I mean, Art was a, a fantastic modern drummer. He's amazing. You know, like, uh, but uh, I don't know if we want to like continue with that route 
I mean, Aaron can play pretty much the stuff that's on those records. So it's like, you know, I mean, a lot of people like the, the Aaron, Aaron was more of a combination of Ted and art, maybe, you know, like he's sort of laid in the middle. So I have to say, but like, uh, like creating songs, like I do, I mainly with the producer, I've been doing most of that. And then the drums are done afterwards. So, you know, we go in and jam them. But like, you know, like I, I never had to worry about what Art would be playing. I mean, because he's just unbelievable. So it's like, uh, you know, if anybody can come in and, and, and mock the parts, you know, they're more than welcome. So that's really, you know, where I'm at. It's like, it, it doesn't really, in other words, it, I don't never have had to put too much emphasis on who's playing drums in the band. I mean, I'm really happy that Art was able to do it for all those years. And he's amazing. You know, and he deserves any success that he's got. It's just like, but, uh, you know, uh, and essentially, like, I got to write the riffs and do the songs. And, you know, that's really where it's at, you know. So, uh, no, I have to see. Now, as I mentioned at the top, we are living in pretty, the buzzword, unprecedented times. And this is pretty much what we ask a lot of the artists because it has affected the music industry across the globe. And it's given artists either the time to reset and kick back or just get creative and, work on on new material uh i think the hardest thing is to get the momentum back for some bands you know used to their album cycle sort of tour approach and again they're saying that tours might not start until sometime in 2021 mid or later in the year so how have you felt that whole uh shake up of a momentum that you've had for a long long time because you always work on different projects and prong and touring and now having all that sort of cease, has it been a good thing for you to sort of reset or has it been climbing the walls, get me out of here, out of here? Well, I mean, I've, I've gotten lucky because uh, this whole thing is totally coincided with the fact that, you know, that my I, my wife got pregnant at the, uh, in November and uh, I just had a another child at my old age, it's at uh, about seven weeks ago. So we were quarantined and I was just taking care of her and I was just making sure we couldn't do anything anyhow because she was pregnant. So like, you know, especially in LA, uh, cause it got hit, the you know, COVID was bad here. And you know, her uh, her doctor was like, don't forget it. So we were completely quarantined. Like, like we were just getting food delivered and we weren't going anywhere for, for nine months. And it's still, since the baby's here, I haven't been, we're still before he gets any shots and everything. So I'm not, I'm really not allowed to do anything anyhow. So mm. I've just been cooking and cleaning and changing diapers and taking care of my wife and, and my baby. So that's pretty much what I've been doing. Well, congratulations, but also moving forward, I mean, do you often think about what kind of future is, is going to happen for, for your new child, considering that we are in pretty intense times, constant government shakeups and protests and people being politically correct about this and that, and there's so many sides. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty chaotic environment and world that we're in, probably the most it's ever been, <laughs> thanks to the what internet as mean? well. It, you know, this is the thing that people don't appreciate. I mean, things were, were everyone. I mean, I'm. This is just me, and um, you know, I, I mean, you, you can't say anything positive these days because then people think you're you're insensitive or whatever. But I just think, you know, for the way I saw it, things were too good for too long. I mean, like I come from an era when I was afraid to get drafted, and like you know, like my brother was in you know, almost got drafted into NOM, you know, and, you know, it's like the sixties were way more turbulent than this. I mean, like where we had, you know, like you, you could get drafted thrown in the army and fucking die, you know, in NOM. And then uh, that threat of that draft was on to like, you know, for a while. Like I, I just, and um, things, you know, we had world wars and there's been Korea and I mean, it's just been, there's been a lot of shit in the last century, you know, and things were, were over the last 15 years, 20 years have been, you know, uh, the younger generation have had it pretty, I think pretty good, you know, like in, you know, uh, you know, the, the economy in America in the last three years is, was explosively great. 
There was no unemployment. Everything was fantastic. And it's just the way things are. It's just got to be, it had to be, there's ups and downs. And, you know, now we're, you know, we're in a down. I think everything's going to come out of it. I mean, as far as the music scene goes, I don't know. Um, but I think this is going to be a vaccine. And I think eventually everyone's going to forget about this shit. It's like, that's, I don't think it's going to last long. I mean, uh, I think that, you know, this is just a temporary, a temporary deal, you know, uh, that's how I look at it. But I, I think things were going too well. Things, I mean, I was like, I'm, I was almost waiting for it. I was like, things are going so good that there's got to be, a, you know, it, it's just, it's just too good. So you were the one who created the virus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, COVID Victor. <laughs> I mean, there's, I know there's tons of conspiracy theories yeah. that I'm, I'm like up on it. And, uh, you know, um, sometimes I believe in it all, you know, but, uh, you know, it's like now I'm starting to feel it where, you know, like, uh, I would like, we went out and took a walk and, you know, it felt really good. You know, it felt really good to get out of the house. That's for sure. But uh, to be totally honest with you, the thought of trying to force anything, like, like I feel bad for the bands and bands and people that, that are like, or to have this sense of urgency of like, oh my, what are we going to do now? deal because like i don't feel that and um you know that i have that um, i have that gl the gift of that like i really you know uh I, we were asked to do some some live stream things i'm not set up to do that right now I, I just don't see any purpose in it you know it's like you know when things settle in and you know you know there's a, a good tour comes up for prong or like there's, there seems to be something like a a reason to make a new record. Like I said, like right now, I, I wouldn't even know what to write about because whatever you're going to say is wrong. And, uh, it's just like, I can't, I can't open my mouth up anymore. It's just gotten that, that way. It's just impossible. Is that because like, of you know, backlash or people's reactions and opinions? Cause it's still your thoughts anyway, and fuck it, put it out there, you know? I, it's just gotten really bad, man. It's just like, you just gotta be, you know, uh, it's just, I, I, I don't like the way things have been going. And, uh, I sort of that, I mean, that way, as far as, I mean, I, I got it out on zero days. Like, like I'm real, that, that was just, um, uh, that zapped me because I, like, there was so much in that lyrically that I really felt that I was able to say, and, uh, I think I did a pretty good job of it. I mean, to repeat that, it was be pointless. So I don't, I don't even know what, I mean, zero days is almost like it was, um, it was almost precognitive in a way of like, you know, just what, you know, uh, what, I mean, if, if this, the actual song zero days is about like a world conspiracy and, uh, you know, just to, to, to annihilate everything. And so, so they could try to start over. So, um, I sort of said it already. I don't even know what to, I mean, the lyrics have a lot to do with what you know what I'm going to put out. I mean, it's just, I mean, I could do this like a riff record and go out and just sing any bullshit like a lot of bands do, and just try to fit some stupid shit on top of it. But I've always found your lyrics really socially aware and really insightful, but also very direct as well. They're very relatable. Uh, you know, it's not um, uh, what's the word? I can't even think. Uh... I don't find it confusing because some artists like to add a lot of little different buzzwords and talk in riddles and poems. And you're like, what the right. hell is this guy talking about or whatever? But I've always found that, you know, you've just always been a straight shooter and you're very direct in, in the way you express what you write about. And, uh, I get some it. Some of it's tongue in cheek. That's the thing too. Like, a, like, you know, especially the cleansing record. I mean, a lot like we, a lot of that was a little bit tongue in cheek here and there. And like we were sort of having a laugh, not to be like you know, uh, you know, like Ricky Gervais or anything. But I was like you're having a laugh, but it's like you know we were having a laugh about it, and it was uh, you know people took it. The, sometimes people take it the wrong way. Now forget it. It's like <laughs> everyone takes everything the wrong way. So you know, I'm just a, I just don't want to deal with all that bullshit. Do you do you think there is any possibility at all that we would see? an MOD or an SOD type band come <laughs> out with just ridiculous no. songs and lyrics Carnivore, that are completely fair. Typo, 
You can't do you can't do that anymore. What are you kidding me? I mean, uh, you know, like uh, Sal, you know, with with the pale horse, sort of try to stay in that tradition a little bit. He's just been fucking blasted. So, you know, like uh, whatever. But that you can't you can't do that anymore. Like, obviously, from a commercial perspective, no no record label is going to pick up a band that is going to sing songs about those types of topics or use particular phrases and so forth. But in, in you know touching on the, the the topic of you know rebellion and stuff like that is is that you know the next frontier for rebellion in music? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think I, I don't think it. It uh, I'm Scott. I mean, I'm going to get blasted for this. I don't think it lies with with rock music anymore. It's like uh, like we're to 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 the general populace we're like dinosaurs like we're just like these these idiots that are just like we don't just this, this, they wouldn't even look to us to anything like uh I, I just think you know uh like i have i have a daughter too like you know and she's just their music is just this other thing that i can't even i don't even know what the hell it is so it's this whole other it just doesn't make any sense, you know. It's uh, it's like really, really. I mean, do you talk to her about it? Do you say what is this about? Explain it to me. And does she say, well, you know, it's this and that? I mean, it's all <laughs> like female empowerment. That's okay. what everything is now. So, so or I'm... some some woke empowerment of some sorts. That's you know, and it's all BS. So you didn't get her onto any carnival albums, by any chance? <laughs> no, she, she, uh, she, I mean, she may say she, I mean, she likes some rock, but no. It's like, yeah. Does she like any prong music? Yeah, she, I mean, she's, she always goes to the shows. I mean, um, you know, she's, I, she's, she thinks, she thinks it's funny. <laughs> Why does she think it's funny? Just oh, look at my dad. What an idiot. You know, is it Pretty like, much, yeah. but she's got to understand the riffs that are coming out. It's just, she'll get it There's one day. Dad. She'll get it one no, day. It's like, well, look at, look at uh, Kanye West. I mean, he sort of they, like a whole generation listened to him. And I don't know what was it like 10 years ago. He said, he goes, guitar should not be on any other modern. Like, they, she, they should be banned. Something along that, paraphrasing him, and people took that to heart. I mean, that's like seriously, like you know, like most, and all the A and R people and people at the big labels are like, oh well, we 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 can't possibly have any music that has guitars on it anymore, like, and that they really did that. I mean, what, you know, there's really not that much anymore. So, well, that's the thing I asked. Certainly not like look. It's certainly not like the '70s when like. You know, like Cat Scratch Fever was number one, you know, like it's, you know, and, you know, every Foreigner song was number one hit, you know, like it's just, it's amazing when you think when rock was king, like when, you know, Peter Frampton and like the whole 70s, you know, that's what it was. And, uh, well, I also and R&B was popular. I mean, it was R&B music and, it, you know, it was, there was, no one was anti r&b music it's just that there was nobody anti rock music now rock is it's it's a bad word it's like it's a bad word nowadays as for, for anyone who's performed on stage as you as you'll be well aware as you get a lot of energy from an audience do you do you, have you over your years have you enjoyed the the, the small clubs where it's two three hundred and it's going wild or maybe you know two three thousand or more uh where it's just a massive people in any of the bands that I've been in, which that have played big places like ministry and dancing and prom, um, for some reason, um, I'm always jealous of the hate breeds and the, you know, devil driver, whoever that have like these unbelievably huge pits that are people. It's like, I've never experienced that. Like where the whole place is just fucking going insane. Like you see videos for you know, it's like, it's even like, you know, to get a dancing shows, it may be a little moshing going on a little bit, you know, 
you know, like prong here and there, and now the ministry was a little bit here and there. So, like, I never really experienced it. When you obviously you're, in a, like, you're playing a prong show to like 200 people, and everyone's grooving out, like chicks and guys, and everyone's like sweaty, and that like th that's a lot of fun, you know. Like, you know, when you know prong has those groovy parts that are just, uh, you know. Uh, knock people out i really like that and, you know that, that's that's a lot of fun but i've never unfortunately i've never really experienced like those those heavy duty mosh fucking things that you see that you know the wall of death and all that it's just never, the bands that i've been in never are in that realm but most of those bands have designed their sound for that reaction so for you to sort of go out and then start creating that stuff people just go what it's like many of these others other artists today too it's like they write mosh sections and breakdowns just because they want to have that footage to say look how crazy the the crowds we had went because the audience is just so i guess to a degree in a a, a sheeple mentality of just let's do a wall of death okay everyone queues up and does it because they've watched the videos of other people at festivals do it on youtube so everyone just kind of again it's like some of these these scene bands it's designed for that purpose their music yeah, is, but you, you know. yeah but to design those parts is is a talent in itself i mean it's like uh, you know, a lot of bands try to do that and it's just like huh and then um you know some bands just have these ridiculously simple things that are just like would i ever even think about playing something that retardedly simple me no but they do it and then people are going nuts and you're like what the f that's killer that's great you know so it's like who the hell knows i mean you just have to have that maybe the fact that i've never really been in the pit that much and i'm not a mosher and you know i i don't have that that testosterone rock thing in me that uh you know i don't that i i don't get it and i'm not really able to so write those things or whatever or with like some of the some things are like a really weird like um I, I don't i don't know how why people are going crazy over it that much it's like it's it's bizarre it's like some bands i've seen them like i've actually there's this bands like popular i don't like to mention names it's a pop band it's got really popular based on like a dri type of style shit and i'm like why the fuck are these kids going crazy you know it's like like i've seen bands like this for years at cbs and it's the like countless ends of bands that sound like nuclear assault and like people are just like bored with it and now this band comes around and people are going fucking absolutely the stage diving and all this i'm like this does why like, i don't get it you know now steven you have a final question one final question tommy given that you know you you touched on you feel like you're an old man uh during this interview um you, you, you obviously very experienced in the music industry. If there's a young kid out there who has aspirations to, to be in the rock or metal scene and make a living out of it, what would be your one piece of advice to them? I think they got to do like, so what do you guys are doing? Like, like, uh, they get a, a job or be part of something like, like, uh, even just being a roadie or getting out on the road is you have to be involved in the music scene 24 hours. Like you can't, like work like a regular job and then do this part half-ass part-time uh, or just stay in your basement all the time. You got to get out there. Well, now, I mean, because of the stupid fucking virus bullshit, but you know, you got to get out and you got to either work at a club or, uh, you know, uh, work with another band and, you know, and, you know, like maybe that one of the guys in the band, uh, you know, has a car accident, you, you're able to fill in for them. You know, just being at the right place at the right time is like, that's like what old men always have told me, like, you know, oh, music business, you got to be in the right place at the right time. You know what? That's really true. The most of the guys that I know that are successful were at the right place at the right time because they allow them, they've availed themselves to be that way. It's like, you, know, you got to will this for you to happen. And you got to keep doing that. You know, you can't, just uh, nothing's going to come to you at all, man. No one's going to like, oh, I'm going to be discovered. You know, like it doesn't exist. So you got to make your own path and, you know, you just got to like will it to happen, you know, unless you're unbelievably, unbelievably talented, like, like Corey Taylor, for instance. So, uh, you know, just like a mastermind of has three bands that are hugely successful. There's that many guys like that. 
Well, it's been a pleasure, Tommy. So thanks so much. And again, keep in touch. Keep us posted on uh, many of the endeavours you have coming up. And uh, you are I will. The man. I will do that. Let's get through this shit, and then I'll see you guys in a couple in a year. Absolutely. <laughs> Look after yourself. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Surprise! Surprise! Surprise!